morning. I'm glad that you're able to join us again this morning. I'm Darrell Johnson, Executive Director of Riverwalk Development Corporation. On behalf of all our partners of the Bearline Trail Neighborhood Development Project, welcome to this Zoom meeting, the history of the Bearline Trail. The Bearline Trail Development Project began in 2013 and includes a number of collaborating organizations, including Riverworks Development Corporation, Riverworks Business Improvement District, the City of Milwaukee, the Greater Milwaukee Committee, MKE LAX, List Milwaukee, along with the Guiding Lens Resident Group and Local Advisory Rail to Trail Conservancy, WIBIC, and the Greater Milwaukee Foundation. Today's feature, webinar feature, keynote speaker, Reggie Jackson, who will share the history of the Bearline Trail with us. As we learn more about the history of the Bearline Trail, we're also thinking of the future. Also, the activities in 2020 were limited. We have big plans ahead. A few things on the horizon, such as trail cleanups are happening on a regular basis, upgrade of the Beerline Trail Plaza, which is located on Houghton near Townsend Street. We'll be planning trees, pavers, water management features, green infrastructure. Another exciting event that's coming up is Arbor Day, an event that will be held at the plaza, which is scheduled for Friday, this Friday at 10 a.m. We also have the installation of, of the Bubba Bike Station near Houghton and Townsend. This will take place mm -hmm. this year. And also in May, we're working with local artist Vidal Hill to finish up two huge murals on the Vienna Access Way as you come in off of Keith Avenue or Capitol, there'll be two huge murals. They'll be done by local artist Fidel Hill. And we have plenty more good stuff coming to the trail. The work on the Bearline Trail is ongoing. As we have shared before, we are launching a capital campaign this year. And meanwhile, we offer this reminder of fun on the Bearline Trail as we look back at Riverworks Week. Let's do a quick flashback to Riverworks Week 2019. One of the exciting events that took place on the Beerline Trail was the Beerline Trail 5K Run and Walk, where over 100 people participated in the event. Here, let's take a short look at the video during Riverworks Week. There we go.
we look forward to a time when we're all able to gather again and enjoy the beauty of the trail. As you can see, we had great fun in 2019, and we look forward to doing some activities in 2021. So continue to watch out for the events, upcoming events, and stay tuned. Now I'd like to welcome our keynote speaker, Reggie Jackson. Reggie is known very well for his, he is a writer, as a researcher, and definitely as a speaker. And as a consultant to media on race relations, he helped institutions and individuals understand how the country racial I have to develop historically, impact our lives daily. And now we can realize America's promise for all its citizens. Thank you, Reggie, for joining us and sharing what you have learned about the history of the Bear Line Trail. Reggie, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome, uh, Daryl. Thank you so much for the uh, for the uh, warm reception. It's great to be here with you all. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen right away so that I can uh, share the presentation that I have put together for you all. So hopefully you all are able to see the first screen there. So uh, I'm gonna take us through a very quick history of the Beer Line Trail. And I'm gonna begin by uh, talking about uh, my connection to the Beer Line Trail. Uh, uh, I started uh, walking uh, on a regular basis uh, a couple of years ago. And one of my preferred uh, kind of places to walk is actually uh, part of the Beer Line Trail. So I'm really glad to be a part of this program today. So let's take a look back at the very early stages of what became the Beer Line Trail. We have to go way back to one of Milwaukee's founding fathers, Byron Kilborn. Uh, and he was kind of a weird guy in some ways. He had these really kind of crazy ideas about things he wanted to do to make money. And one of those ideas was he wanted to be able to connect the city of Milwaukee with the Mississippi River by building these really long canals, right? And so when he came up with this idea to build these canals, people were like, okay, uh, Byron, that's really kind of a crazy idea. Uh, and not many people supported it, but since he was who he was, he was able to get the project started, and they built part of the canal, about a mile and a quarter worth of it, and then people finally were just like, dude, this is crazy. This stop the project. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So they, they, they completed a small portion of it, and then they kind of killed the project, uh, and eventually, uh, a couple years later, they actually filled in the canal that had been dug up out of the ground. And that's what Commerce Street became was what, what that canal was that Byron Kilbourne wanted to build. So he realized that, okay, that project wasn't gonna work. So he got into the railroad business and he started a railroad and there was a lot of competition for railroads at the time. But eventually he started the Lacrosse and Milwaukee Railroad. And this, uh, rail line ended up being known years later as the beer line because it was a rail line that the big breweries, uh, Pabst and Slits, who were right along the path of it, uh, and there were others, Miller, uh, Blatt's, several others, and then a, a lot of other big companies used that rail line to transport goods and commodities from Milwaukee to the far reaches of the country. And so it became known as a beer line because Milwaukee was, you know, was Brew City. And Paps and Schlitz uh, shipped their stuff on those trains uh, around the country. And what ends up happening, it, it became a prominent part of kind of the city of Milwaukee. You know, these big breweries uh, that gave the city its name uh, and the fact that the trains took this beer uh, people were able to build these little model trains, <laughs> which I, I find kind of amusing. You have these model trains that, you know, model trains are like for kids, right? But you have like Paps Blue Ribbon on a model train for kids. Well, I guess adults use model trains too, but I, I found that kind of funny. But, you know, it was a very prominent part of uh, the infrastructure of Milwaukee. Uh, Milwaukee was manufacturing capital of the United States uh, for a very long period of time. And uh, the, the, the rail line, the beer line, was a really, really incredibly important part of making Milwaukee what it was in terms of having international reach uh, economically and created a lot of really, really good jobs for a lot of people uh, in metro Milwaukee over a long period of time. So that rail line, the beer line, was incredibly important 
asset to the entire region, uh, allowed all of those big businesses to transport their goods and commodities around the country. And even though it was known as the beer line, there was a whole lot of other stuff that was transported along those rail lines other than beer. Um, and, you know, uh, everything was going really well um, in Milwaukee. Things started to slow down somewhat in the 70s. You started to see, uh, you know, the economy in Milwaukee start to suffer. But really, the 1980s, there were two recessions in the 1980s, one that, uh, you know, really isn't all that memorable. 1980 lasted about six months. Uh, but the bigger one was one that hit in 1981 through 1982. And that at the time was the largest recession since the Great Depression. So it was really a devastating uh, recession. And it really, really hit Milwaukee like a gigantic sledgehammer. Did some really, really um, major damage to Milwaukee's economy. And really, the city has never fully recovered from that. So I know that we have uh, my buddy John Schmidt is on the panel today. And, and I love this, this series that he wrote back in 2004 called The Dream Derailed, uh, talking about you know, what happened when those manufacturing jobs started to go away. It's a phenomenal piece. If you can find it online, uh, it's well worth reading the entire series that John did. Uh, I've referenced it uh, a number of times in the work that I do. And I think it's just really one of the greatest pieces of journalism in the history of the city of Milwaukee, in my opinion. Um, and so part of what happens is, you know, those manufacturing jobs start to go away. And the manufacturing jobs are really critically important to everybody in Milwaukee, but particularly to the Black community. About 43% of Blacks in Milwaukee in 1970 worked in those jobs. 52% of all Black men in the city who were working worked in those blue collar manufacturing uh, facilities. And about 85% of all Black men at that time were in the workforce. So it was a good place to be if you were Black back in 1970 uh, before those recessions hit. And once those recessions hit and those jobs went away, we really, really suffered tremendously. And a lot of the things that we see today, kind of the ills of Milwaukee that we see today are directly related. Uh, to the loss of those manufacturing jobs. They were good jobs. They were family supporting wage jobs. And they allowed people to have a good standard of living, uh, a good pension when they retired, free health care, all of those things. But of course, we started to see some of those places close. We saw Schlitz close in 1981, Paps close in 1996. A good, good friend of mine, a guy I used to work with, worked for Paps for 35 years and retired uh, and then found out a number of years later that the pension was all gone, that he had to go back to work. I mean, he was over 70 years old. He had to go back to work. So it really impacted a lot of people in the beer line shut down in 1985, simply because it just wasn't enough traffic. Uh, once some of the big factories and the breweries and tanneries closed, that there just wasn't enough rail traffic for it any longer. So it was very unfortunate. But, you know, I don't think that many people associate that rail line with Milwaukee and jobs and family supporting wage jobs and the health of the black community in particular, but it was a very important part of that. Um, so this neighborhood, you know, the River West neighborhood and Harambe neighborhood have a very, very interesting history. This is a little bit of the 1938 redlining map that was drawn in Milwaukee County. And the area where Harambe uh, and River West neighborhoods, you know, sit side by side on either side of Holton Street, that area was actually redlined back in 1938. And contrary to what most people believe, redlining wasn't just about redlining neighborhoods where Black people live. Uh, it redlined neighborhoods in Milwaukee where Italians live. Uh, it redlined neighborhoods where Blacks and Jews live. And it also redlined this particular neighborhood that was a Polish neighborhood. Uh, so each one of those maps came with documentation that described why it got the ratings it got. And so every area that was red was designated D something. So area D3, uh, on that redlining map uh, in, in the, the, the documents explaining why I got that rating of, of hazardous in red, it said it was because of Polish infiltration, Polish infiltration. So these were uh, later arriving Polish immigrants to the city 
And at that particular time, there was a great deal of anti-immigrant fervor, particularly against immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe, but also from places like Ireland and Poland at that time as well. So that area eventually became the River West and Harambe neighborhoods, but it's interesting that it started off as a Polish neighborhood years ago, and that that neighborhood was redlined, which meant that it was very difficult to to get a loan to purchase a home. So of course we know that those two neighborhoods that sit side by side don't look a lot like each other demographically. Um, and you know, the, 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 the socioeconomic status of people in those two neighborhoods are really uh, quite different as well. As we look at these numbers, we, we see uh, that in the Harambe neighborhood, the uh, median household income is only $23,000, uh, whereas it's nearly $35,000 in River West. So significantly higher. Uh, you see the demographics, uh, Harambe, 84% uh, Black, uh, whereas only 25% of the River West neighborhood is Black. Uh, now, years ago, River West neighborhood used to be a Black and Hispanic, Puerto Rican particularly, a neighborhood. Uh, there weren't a whole lot of whites in that neighborhood. So it's changed over the last, you know, 20 plus years. Uh, and it's unfortunate that the unemployment rate in Harambe uh, is 17% and only 6% in River West. So we have these two neighborhoods that sit side by side, but really uh, living in those two neighborhoods is quite a bit different. And, and for those who've been in Milwaukee long enough to know that Holton Street was always this kind of invisible barrier uh, that designated on one side of the line there were white people, on the other side of the line there were black people. That's one of those invisible segregation barriers that Milwaukee had. So when those uh, manufacturing jobs disappeared, uh, it had a huge impact on the beer line. So let's kind of take a look. This is um, from the Dream Derail series that John Schmidt did. There, this wonderful uh, photograph showing all of those different businesses. And, and like I said, if you can, if you can look this up online, it's a fabulous way of looking at what happened when those factories closed. You see all of those little uh, dots and numbers. Those represent uh, businesses that were there, uh, some that were still around, some that were gone. And as you can see, uh, Pabst Brewing Company and Schlitz Brewing Company are down at the southern end of the beer line. And you can see um, in 1970, Schlitz had 2,800 employees, but by 2004, you know, it was gone. So there was nobody left there. Uh, Pabst, uh, 2,600 employees in 1970, and you know it was closed, so nobody there by 2004. And even a, a big company like A.O. Smith, who had over 8,000 employees in 1970, that number was less than uh, 600 uh, by 2004. And then a couple years after that, they were gone too. So a lot of really, really good jobs, high quality, uh, family supporting wage jobs were aligned with the beer line. You know, that, that train that took these goods and commodities really provided income for a lot of families in Milwaukee. You know, American Motors uh, was a, a big employer. Uh, my father-in-law actually retired from American Motors. Actually, they left Milwaukee and they moved down to Kenosha. And he had to transfer, you know, from working in Milwaukee and having a short drive to work to driving all the way to Kenosha until he retired. Um, so um, a lot of changes happened along the beer line as those businesses, you know, went away, then the rail line went away. And, you know, eventually it was uh, put in a condition where it wasn't needed anymore. I think it's important for us to understand how important the job losses were, the manufacturing job losses. Uh, from 1963 to 2017, the city of Milwaukee, now this doesn't include the suburbs and the exurban counties, Walker, Shaw's, Argue, Washington. This is just the city of Milwaukee. It lost 92,000 manufacturing jobs from 1963 to 2017. And nearly 51,000 of those have been lost since uh, 1982. So can you imagine a city that was doing really, really well, uh, losing that many jobs and the impact that it has. That is why Milwaukee looks the way it looks today. These were the top employers, the top 10 employers in Metro Milwaukee in 1970. Alice Chalmers, A.O. Smith, Briggs & Stratton, Allen Bradley, AC Electronics, Harness Baker, American Motors, Schlitz, Paps, Miller Brewing. All of these were, were big employers. And, you know, as you can see, uh, many of them are gone. And the ones that are left are very much smaller than they were. And that has had a devastating impact on the city of Milwaukee. Um, and it, it's, it's incredibly important for us to understand that, you know, when we look at the unemployment situation in Milwaukee, it's not because people got lazy all of a sudden, it's because the jobs went away. Uh, they either went away or they moved further away from the city. 
and they're harder to access. So, of course, you know, the beer line uh, was shut down in 1980s. It was just kind of an eyesore in Milwaukee, very polluted, very ugly, kind of dangerous. Uh, and people in 2002 started to say, wait a minute, let's see if we can do something different with this rail line. Let's see if we can turn it into something that'll be useful for this city again. And so this resurrection of the beer line started. And I want to show you a video now uh, that will tell you the history of the beer line uh, and how it came to be what it is today, this thing that we are celebrating today. So let me switch to this video and I'll go ahead and start the video for you all. Welcome to the Beer Line Trail. Our grand vision is for this simple trail to transform into a premier destination spot right here in Milwaukee's historic Harambe neighborhood. We need investments, large and small, from everyone, including people and organizations like yours. With your support, we can create one of Milwaukee's premier art and culture parks. Beyond the financial investment, we want you to partner with us in the park's development, follow the work, and share in the excitement once it's complete. Join us in making the Beer Line Trail Connector Park a reality. The Beer Line Trail is the famous rail line site known for carrying Milwaukee's most known staple, beer. By 1990, the Beer Line Rail Line right-of-way was abandoned as industry and transportation in Milwaukee changed. Since 2002, neighborhood residents, together with the city of Milwaukee, removed old railroad tracks and created the first phase of the Beer Line Trail from Bremen to Buffum. The trail now extends to Capitol. Over the last decade, approximately $2.9 million has been invested in the newest extension of the Beer Line Trail from Burleigh to Capitol Drive. This investment included land acquisition and trail construction, community improvement projects, planning, engagement and programming, and environmental remediation. It also leveraged real estate development adjacent to the trail. The Beer Line Trail runs through Harambe and River West neighborhoods and the Riverworks Creative District as the bridge that connects all three. We saw communities come together to decide what they wanted from the public assets in their space. Teaming up with world-renowned landscape architect and artist, Walter Hood of Hood Design Studios, and the winner of this year's MacArthur Fellowship, we created a park design rightfully called the LifeWays Plan. The LifeWays Plan design for the Connector Park includes community greenhouses, a large performance stage, play and workout equipment, cafe and community space, green space, and other first-class amenities. This park will be a world-class cultural destination for all. The Beer Line is the tie that binds. With a mission to sustain and enrich the lives of neighbors in Harambe and River West, we promote health, well-being, and prosperity in both neighborhoods by sharing resources, voices, ideas, labor, and creativity. The LifeWays Plan, along with the Equitable Implementation Plan, ensures everyone benefits a direct result of years of visioning, imagination, and planning in collaboration with residents, workers, artists, community organizers, the city of Milwaukee, local and citywide organizations such as Riverworks, Greater Milwaukee Committee, Lisk Milwaukee, MKE to LAX, Greater Milwaukee Foundation, and the Rails to Trails Conservancy. Your investment creates employment and small business opportunities in a neighborhood where joblessness rates are higher than in other parts of the city. Your investment helps give a voice and power to those historically locked out of opportunities seen in other parts of our community, such as downtown Milwaukee. Your investment spurs further investment in housing, business development, good schools, and wealth building. And your investment sparks hope. We'd like to invite you to become an integral part of our community. 
Be a part of creating the Beer Line Connector Park. We can't wait to partner with you. See you soon. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing, and that is all that I have for you all this morning. Thank you. Again, Reggie, thank you so much for your research and presentation. As someone who has grown up in this neighborhood, I have seen firsthand what has happened on the beer line and has impacted so much of the surrounding neighborhood. The beer line was once an economic engine for many of the area businesses. The businesses used the rail line to get the raw products into their businesses and to ship them back out once they were completed. And these products went all across the country, not only servicing the breweries, but also other industries. Now let's please welcome three individuals who will participate in a panel discussion along with Reggie. Sandra Gillard is a Harambe resident, an artist dedicated to designing programming, grounded in African diaspora. John Smith is a retired Milwaukee Journal Signal reporter who reports on a three-part series, A Dream Derail, which won the best Business for Special Project Award from the, from the Society of America Business Editors and Writers. His work has also been honored by press, Associated Press Media Editors, the National Headline Award, and the Fund for American Studies. And finally, myself, um, as a longtime resident of this area um, and also worship and work in this area, I look forward to all these amazing things that will be happening over the next few years related to the Beer Line Trail and the economic development within our community. Also, I want to thank Roslyn Wolf, Community Creative Placemaking and Economic Development Coordinator here at Riverworks. Uh, Roslyn, I just love that title. Who gave that title to you? <laughs> of course, Daryl gave me a long seven word title. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I am, like Daryl said, Rosalind Wolf of Riverworks. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Reggie, for kicking us off. That was a great presentation. Um, really good. It's always really good learning about historical facts about where you live, anywhere in the world, but especially where you live. Um, it kind of just opens up a whole new world for you. Thank you, Daryl, for, for bringing us in and for being a panelist who's supposed to have another um, Riverworks uh, board member, longtime board member, Bob Gintoff, but he couldn't join us. So Daryl stepped in, as he said, a longtime resident of the neighborhood, has worked here, played here, has worshiped here. Um, and so he has both a connection, both personally and professionally. That's that perspective. Uh, we are glad to um, have it here. And thank you, John and Sandra, for being with us. Um, mm -hmm. John has this amazing series, so we have a lot to learn from him. And then Sandra is a amazing artist and community um is very active in the community and in this neighborhood 1968 so um sandra's camera unfortunately is not working but we can hear her loud and clear so we'll ask her questions just as we would on um, the other panelists before we begin just know that any female has any questions <coughs> excuse me feel free to put them in the question and answer section and we will answer them um, after the panelists speak we want to leave about 10 minutes for everyone to, uh, for any questions to be um, asked and answered by the panelists. Um, so we will get started with uh, Sandra Gillard. So Sandra, my qu first question um, is for you. And I just wanna know, could you share your experiences and memories of the art um, in the community? Oh, and absolutely. This is on King, King Drive and Harambe neighborhood. I'm sorry. Sure. Yeah, sure, I can do that. Um, wow. Let me just first say that we came into the Harambe neighborhood the year of 67, 68. And I do remember the vibrance of American Motors and all the little shops that supported the big companies. So this is a change, okay? <laughs> but in terms of the arts, you know, it goes way back. Um, you know, we started out as part of, um, you know, like a black arts theater. And that was back in like 67. And along with that came this radio show that we had on years and years ago, it was like 67, 68 with OC White, it was called Youth Has a Say. 
We also had Echoes Writers Workshop right down on Third North with uh, Virginia Little. And she was a stickler for young folks like us because we were really, I'm really into writing poetry and short stories and stuff like that. So, and there's a story to tell about her run, babe. So many people around there, a lot of them have gone through the pandemic. Um, there was the Academy of the Arts with Don Jackson, and that had been there for a long standing piece for a long time. And also the Academy, which was a social outlet where a lot of young musicians used to come in, sit in. There was also the Black Arts Theater with Will Crittenden and Cynthia Bryant Pitts, along with the, you know, Fern um, evolved out of that with Kofi. We were on third and center. It was also a small art press right on top of third and center, which was run by back then Tom Norman. I can't say his African name right, but you know who I'm talking about. Um, there was a Kink Chuju and there was, you know, um, Evelyn Terry was a part of that. There was many, many artists. Then we moved to Fourth and Center where the Black Arts Theater had a temporary building and it grew. We had a theater component, dance component, a young jazz workshop through Berkeley FUD and all them. And Tay Jumala and myself, we were all Black poetic messengers because we were dealing with Gwen Brooks and my Habudi down in Chicago because he had the organization of Black African culture. Then we had the Kumasi House, with, which was Joan, and they ran Joan out of there because her material was too Black. She was on 3rd and North on the west side of the street. She had the old uh, Three Sisters department store. And out of that whole dancing piece in Harambe came, you know, there was Alberta Scott out of Philadelphia. And, you know, she was teaching us about Miles Davis back in 65. You know, we had Salonius Monk. We were performing to that. She was out of Philadelphia. Sarah was out of New York. When I got to New York, ended up working with her nephew, uh, Charles Grant, who was dancing with Alvin Ailey. And I was just, I had a scholarship there before I started dancing with Sam Rivers. Then we had, um, now, Gwen Brooks actually came to my house on Richard Street. She and my family, after we got arrested over at Garfield Park for reading our poetry, they said it was profane, okay? Mm. <laughs> but my whole thing was, is that Harambe had a vibrant community. There were a bunch of jazz houses down here. And we missed, of course, um, oh, what's, what's the place right over here on, um, uh, oh, Jesus right here at, wow, I'm getting old, okay? <laughs> but um, we had a jazz club over here that was run by a man and his son. And they had good food and everything. Son's name was Kelvin. I just can't think of it. Oh, help me, help me, help me. Somebody help me, y'all, y'all too young, huh? <laughs> was it but the main event? Was the main event, that's what I'm talking about. Yep, yeah. And then, you know, there were other jazz clubs here in Harambe too. And the only thing that really, really got next to me was coming back into the city after years of being gone and all that creative energy had disappeared. And I said, I know that it's still here and it had to be transformed back to the madness that we're experiencing now into something creative. That's right. And hi, Reggie, you come back on my show, you hear me? But anyway, oh, absolutely. <laughs> anyways, I can tell you um, about a lot of the people that, you know, have left here and, and you know, a lot of them I, I caught when I was living in Atlanta and New York and there was a bunch in Milwaukee to have Milwaukee night in San Francisco. Most of those people are from Harambe, people I went to high school with. So there are a lot of good energies we just have to, you know, seek and find again. Am I going too long? And on? bring it back. Yes, thank you. No, you're Please fine. Stop. You're great. But thank you so much. Uh -huh. That's amazing to hear about all the things that it, that were in the in the space and that we uh, bring back. Okay. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that knowledge. Um, so, John, my next question is for you. Um, in 2004, you wrote the series that um, Reggie uh, mentioned and used some uh, statistics from the Journal Sentinel called A Dream Derailed, uh, which share the impact of the plant closures like American Motors that Reggie talked about um, and the resulting job losses in the Black community. So, looking back at that series and where we are today, um, can you tell us have you seen any progress? Well, by the way, I'm, before I even start that, I want to say that uh, I'm really honored 
to talk about this work and feel its relevance, even though I wrote it in 2003, because even though I wrote it in 2003, the relevance of the, of the fundamental questions we're talking about honestly has never been bigger in the times I've been watching the city. So like, it's a big question and I'm gonna just speak kind of slowly. I'll be, I'll be time efficient, but bear with me. It's a big question because what happened in Milwaukee, the, the deindustrialization in Milwaukee was actually unprecedented among the American cities in the United States of America. Milwaukee's special in its extremes. Milwaukee is an aberrational city. What we did in this series, it looked like this when it came out, a dream derailed. Reggie, thank you for the nice words about that, by the way. We got the name from Langston Hughes. Hey, hey, brother, haven't you heard the boogie woogie rumble of a dream deferred? I'm gonna read two sentences at the very beginning of the story, just to give you a sense of what, we were, what we're talking about here. Because there's, Milwaukee has these big dimensions. If you're gonna talk about Milwaukee, you have to talk about the beer line. But if you have to talk about the Milwaukee, you have to talk about what's at stake. The first sentence we wrote in that story, and we backed it up then with like about, well, I mean, Reggie, did we, did we have statistics in that story? Boatloads of statistics. Thank I love you. it. <laughs> and so what we wrote with those statistics is no other major urban center in America has suffered as much as Milwaukee's from the economic upheaval of a globalizing economy. In little more than a generation, Milwaukee has morphed from an El Dorado of unrivaled opportunity for African-Americans and a beacon for their middle-class aspirations to a locus of downward mobility without equal among other big US cities. So <clears throat> um, I always thought that you gotta pay attention to what goes on in Milwaukee. If Milwaukee can get it right, to your question, any city can. The, um, and that's why I've always felt like the journalism you do here or the historical analysis you do here, or I'm gonna talk to Sandra, I really appreciated your perspective because I heard so often, in the heyday, in the golden era, there were these beautiful jazz clubs. There was music. There was every sign that you were going to have Harlem or I believe it's called the Greenwood District in Tulsa. Am I right, Chess? Reggie? Yep, Greenwood District, Tulsa. Black Wall Street. You had that. It was, I never saw that. At the time I wrote this Story, what I saw was uh, what looked to me like Europe, Europe, Eastern Europe after the fall of communism. It was, it was devastating. But when I wrote that, <clears throat> I was naive. I thought the jobs, because you can correlate all, all the jobs. And Reggie and I have had this discussion so much. You, you can correlate the jobs one for one for the, to, to, to the, collapse of all the social structures that we're talking about. But once the social structures collapsed, you had more to think about than jobs. So your question, which was, have I seen progress? Well, economically, I'm not even gonna talk about jobs. Right now we're in the middle of a pandemic and the entire American economy is artificially being supported with all sorts of um, economic stimulants and checks and make work jobs. It's, it's not a real economy right now. It's little, value to talk about jobs when what really needs to happen is a discussion that isn't really happening either. It came up and I'm going to use every shorthand I know because I, I don't know how to get to this in the time we've got. It came up with the aftermath of George Floyd. Has there been progress on the issues that the execution of George Floyd has raised? Has there been progress on that? We were joking around before the panel started. How can you even begin to address that in this format? Um, there's a lot to talk about there. I'll, I'll, do you mind? I'll just yield at that point. 
Thank you so much. So I definitely feel feel all of that. So thank you. Um, there, we're gonna go to uh, Daryl, who is our um, so panelist, I suppose, been in the community a long time. But just from your perspective, Daryl, uh, again, from being here as a uh, living in the neighborhood and also working in the neighborhood and doing what you've done and built what you have built working at Riverworks, um, what are your memories of the impact of the closure of American Motors and, and other businesses that were in the area? Yeah, this has been, you know, some very good information that have been shared. Uh, my family moved into around First and Keith in 1960 and we were probably one of three black families who moved into this area so if you think about where we live and where american motors headquarters was at we probably was about maybe five blocks away from american motors and american motors really had a lot of spin-off companies that also lo located here that were suppliers uh, we had a lot of repair shops you know, as a kid growing up you know at, at the end of the day i mean they had two shifts so at the end of each shift, you could imagine all these cars leaving the neighborhood, you know, the Pacer, you know, Gremlin, you know, I always thought the Pacer was a cool car, you know, it looked like a spaceship. So you see these cars leaving out the neighborhood, but they also, at lunchtime, when they got paid, they will easily go over to the, the bar and they'll cash your check. So a lot of these bars, when they knew payday was coming, they was basically went to the bank themselves to be able to pay these people out. So there was this community within the community that really supported a lot of these industry within this neighborhood. So when these industries started to leave, a lot of these bars, restaurants, bowling alleys also started to, to leave the neighborhood. So over time, as a lot of people know, the divide between Holden Street in River West and Harambe really became more noticeable. <laughs> and it really brought to attention how devastating Harambe uh, started to, because of vacant border properties, the disinvestments, um, because the northern end of King Drive, or we used to call it Third Street, had all the makings of downtown, where you had your five and, five and, dime, five and dime stores, your banks, your drug stores, so it was a, a community, once again, within the community that supported um, its residents. So things are a lot different today. Um, will we ever see that again within the Harambe area? No, things will look a lot different, but there's an opportunity for us to really kind of build off what we have started within this community. Thank you for that. Um, it's always interesting, me growing up, listening to people who are older, talk about what used to be um, but it's good to hear those stories, especially um, Sandra, and I'm because I'm coming back to you for the question. Hearing that, like it just it gives you an opportunity to see what can be. Like it opens you up that you know we had it, we can get it back. You know, um, so that leads me to my question for you, Sandra. Uh, Sandra, how do you see the work on the Bridgeline Trail bringing back some of that artistic and cultural history that that once was in the area? You know, I really think that. Um... The Beer Line Trail could be like a, a mecca that draws artists towards it because you mentioned that there'd be large uh, stage, but I could also see turning some of those buildings that are not occupied into artists' quarters so they can live. But I also see, you know, like, you know, I'm in the community farming and stuff. I can see a whole bunch of, you know, developing a really hearty, you know, farmer's market there, you know, just all kinds of stuff. And I think that artists, you know, will come because they gravitate to nature. The other thing I could see is, you know, musicians in the park. You know, I was also used to seeing, you know, old men doing dominoes in the park, you know, family things that went on. And, you know, I think it can be drawn back to the source, you know, but it just has to be where, you know, you almost got to do a whisper campaign, you know, folks start showing up. And, you know, it could gradually grow, you know what I'm saying? And the project you guys have, I think is phenomenal. And, you know, the whole community could par probably participate in one way or the other in terms of, you know, you know, help build revenue for it, you know, by dealing with that whole block to block thing because money's gonna be generated. The idea is beautiful. 
So I envision it being a space that people come and 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 they, you know, not only do they activate, they create, you know. Mm. So I could see that happening. Thank you. That's good. Um, John, I'm coming back back to you. Um, this is probably giving you a summer to comment on what other people have said, but in your two part a series you wrote the beer line did more than keep the north side factories humming it literally encircled the perimeter of the Milwaukee's uh, black community like an economic circle of covered wagons the beer line defined define where they lived and worked can you share more about what you learned um, about the history of the vibrant neighborhoods that surrounding the beer line trail yeah that was the most wonderful you know in an otherwise kind of dark story <laughs> it was the brightest part of the research. <clears throat> I've walked to the Beer Line Trail, which loops up past Schlitz, up north, through the area we're talking about, uh, up over Capitol, and then back down past Miller, past Harley. Um, and I always called it industrial archaeology. Um, mm -hmm. And you hear a lot of these stories. Um, Sandra was talking about jazz clubs. <laughs> hey, I, since, Jeff, since Sandra brought it up, um, one of the things I loved so much was the names of these jazz clubs. I hadn't heard of the one that she mentioned, but they had these you know, beautiful names, the Moon Glow. Um, I listed a whole bunch of them, but that's the point. In a city where you had very real racial barriers for African-Americans to go out into the downtown or into the suburbs to go into their clubs. <clears throat> there was a lot of white people who came in to these jazz clubs too. There was Banks, famous movie theater, black owned entrepreneurship on full display, full flourishing black owned businesses. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, that's the, that's the really harsh part of it all because of this, you know, this, this uh, history in the United States of the survival rate of these great black owned communities. Am I right, Reggie? You know, you can, <clears throat> um, Rosewood, mm -hmm. Tulsa, you know, uh, Milwaukee's was <clears throat> the lower ninth ward in New Orleans was underwater for three days before anyone thought to do anything about it. Sure. But the, when the levees broke in Milwaukee, they were economic ones. Um, I wanna say, <clears throat> I wanna say um, a, a really quick story. In the second part of, of this series, which you can find online, my name, Dream Derailed, Journal Sentinel, it, it's, we, we re-archived it. I met a woman who, um, is Sharon Adams. She works in a part of the city that's not directly on the beer line, but she's very familiar with the history of the breweries and the history of the city. She grew up here, she moved back here. She grew up here in the heyday, in the colorful time. She moved back and couldn't believe what had transformed in the neighborhood. The great vitality that Sandra was talking about wasn't there anymore. And I quoted her at length, but what, what, what amazes me about Sharon Adams is that she said, I'm gonna reclaim my old neighborhood. One block, I'm gonna rebuild the houses. It's like gaping because when a house was derelict, the city said, rip it down. Sharon and her husband, Larry, said, we'll fix it up and someone can actually live in it. Or we'll put a community center in it. We'll put music in it. We'll do what Sandra was talking about. She made that vision happen. And I remember so vividly <clears throat> what happened when I was talking to a friend of mine who I won't name, because it will embarrass him, who thought he was the know-it-all about urban revival in Milwaukee. And he scoffed at Sharon. He should have known better. He scoffed, he said, you think you're gonna turn around a neighborhood by planting peach trees in it? At the time I thought that was a logical, economically logical thing to say. We talk about the invisible hand, we talk about supply and demand. Since that time, Sharon Adams has come on 
and Julia Taylor will confirm this, she is now the matriarch of urban renewal in Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. You don't necessarily need to start with the jobs to create stability and cohesion and collective efficacy and a sense of neighborhood. And above all, I am safe. I think that the really creative solutions to turn around neighborhoods aren't always, I don't think that there's a great track record in this city of jobs driven neighborhood renewal. Nothing's wrong with the jobs, you need the jobs, but they don't get the job done. Okay, John, thank you. <laughs> Um, we need like three hours, four hours because this is, this is amazing. Um, Dare, I am coming back to you, uh, which, which, you know, right in line with what John was saying is what do you feel the importance of the private public collaborations uh, for development in the area um, are? Yeah, I mean, John is so knowledgeable about what he's talking about, what he's sharing. And yeah, jobs. We always talk about, yeah, jobs is going to be the turning point within a lot of our communities. Um, but there's other key components. I mean, as we deal with a racial issue uh, <clears throat> throughout the country and how we work through it within the city of Milwaukee is going to be the key to how we build strong neighborhoods. Uh, Milwaukee is one of those cities where it's broken up by neighborhoods. Um, we categorize each neighborhood by name now. And Harambe is probably is known for Swahili name pulling together. So it's, it's the only African-American neighborhood uh, within the city of Milwaukee. And, and it has a lot of opportunities, not only to create those jobs on the back end, but also deal with those other issues which impact this neighborhood, housing, crime, um, education. I mean, we need to look at our schools within our community. Uh, we need to look at how do we increase our relationship with the Milwaukee Police Department, where we know that we don't have to worry about our kids going out and being out past a certain time and praying that they come home safe. So there's a, a lot of issues rather than just dollars and cents. It's really kind of building that sense of community. And, and I think once you do that, uh, the investment will come. And I think by us really looking at the Bear Line Trail as a connector between neighborhoods, not only between neighborhoods, but connected within the city of Milwaukee, is that we're looking at how do we deal with the race issue? How do we deal with the economic opportunity that this trail can spin off? Um, hopefully those businesses that are locally owned, um, those businesses that really hire people from the neighborhood. So that partnership with the private sector, not only with the public is, is key because we do need that investment from the outside coming in, but it has to be where people voices are also heard. Um, we just don't need things to come into our neighborhood and say, well, we're gonna make it better. You know, it needs to be a collaborative effort where everybody's at the table speaking the same language, wanting to get things done for the community in a positive way. Thank you, thank you. And now we are going to our keynotes. Um, so you're known for sharing seldom told stories and data about experiences with African-Americans and other people of color, both past and present. Uh, what voices have you, um, have been unheard in our stories of the beer line and the Harambe neighborhood itself um, and, and others surrounding it that you would want to highlight? You know, I, I think one of the important things is what we were able to see in the video um, that I showed is just how diverse the usage of that space is, right? It's people from all over that are using that space. And I think one of the things that, that we focus way too much on Milwaukee is, and, and for obvious reasons, there's a lot of challenges we have, right? A lot of really difficult circumstances. And, and we focus a lot of our attention on the negatives and, and we don't shine a light on the positive things that are happening, right? I think there are a lot of people in Milwaukee that would be really surprised to, to see what's going on with the Beer Line Trail to see the revitalization of an area that was pretty much, I mean, just kind of forsaken and forgotten about for really uh, almost two decades after the rail line itself closed uh, and how people have been very creative 
and reaching out to the people in the community and asking them what they want to see. That's something that's very rare. That doesn't happen in Milwaukee, right? You know, developers come in and they say, I have this great idea and I want to do X, Y, and Z, but you have the voices of the people in the community, they're, they're just left out. And I think that, that what's incredible about this project is that uh, community members were involved in voicing their ideas about what they wanted to see what they thought could be done with the Beale Line Trail and all of the things that are going to come as a result of it. Because I think what's going to happen is you're going to begin to see the people that, that generally aren't listened to, average, regular, everyday Black people in Milwaukee who are never listened to by our, by our policymakers, our elected officials don't really listen to them, even though they're their constituents. I think you're beginning to see more of their voices being heard because they have stepped up to the plate and said, listen, we want to advocate for our communities. We want to advocate. We want to create something for our children that's like what our grandparents told us about, right? You know, it, it amazes me when I tell people about growing up in Milwaukee, moving here from Mississippi in 1973 and how wonderful it was, how great it was, right? We used to ride our bikes over by the beer line trail all the time, right? We used to go to places all over the city and nobody ever bothered us, right? We, we never had to worry. My mother, half the time my mother didn't even know where I was at, right? I was all over the city with my friends, right? Because it was a safe place because everybody had good jobs, right? You had good jobs and you had an economic situation that supported everybody. And what happens is when you revitalize an area, it doesn't just revitalize what you're revitalizing, but what it does is it has a ripple effect. It begins to impact things nearby those, right? Just as, as Dara was sharing, you know, the bowling alleys and places like that that were supported by, uh, you know, American Motors and what ends up happening when you re revitalize an area and you use the voices of the people in that community, they tell you what they want to see in that community. They tell you what they want their children to enjoy. Because one of my, my, my greatest desires about Milwaukee is I want young people who are living in Milwaukee today to experience the Milwaukee that I experienced as a kid. Now, we know it's never going to come back. John is, is clear on that. But I think that we can create some spaces that replicate that experience. You can go to spaces where you're going to see people who are doing well right? You're not going to just see the ugly parts of Milwaukee. You're going to see some of the parts of Milwaukee that even though they're kind of ugly, the people are actually doing okay, right? And you're going to begin to see the, the diversity of people that are using this, this, this trail to show that, listen, despite what we've been told, there are things in Milwaukee that we can that we can fix a little bit at a time. I always say it's, it's, it's one person at a time. You help one person at a time, and that grows out to now helping families, right? And then when those families are helped, then you, you're helping the people on the block. You know, Dara, when you were talking about like, you know, your block, uh, and, and, and well, not, not you, but when John was talking about, uh, you know, this block that's been revitalized, it reminded me of my old block. I wrote a series of articles about my old block that I grew up on. And when I went over there two years ago to look at my old block, and I saw like three boarded up houses on the block, I saw like three houses that don't exist because they've been torn down. And I remember how and just vibrant that block was, especially our house, because everybody used to come to our house to play basketball. And it was like a community hub, right? Our house was. And when you can create that, you create a hub where people come together and they're, they're comfortable and they feel safe, then everything grows outside of that, right? It's like a tree. When you first plant that tree, it's really small, but over the course of time, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And I want to continue to see the voices of people in the community, the people that generally aren't listened to. And I think people are beginning to listen to them more projects. I want people to continue to listen to those voices because people come into the black community and they say, we want to help, but they generally don't say, we want to help. What can I do? They come in and say, we want to help. This is what I plan to do. I don't want people to do that. I want you to come in and painful. say, I want to help. What can I do for you? Because the people in the community know what they want. They know what they need. They know what they desire. And it isn't necessarily what somebody with money desires, right? So I look at this project and I say, this is one of those few instances in Milwaukee where we've gotten it right, where we've gotten the community involved in those voices that are unheard, are being listened to. I feel really, really good about this. It's one of the few things in Milwaukee I can say I honestly feel really good about right now. There's not a whole lot else. This is something I'm like, this is really, really nice. Well, thank you so much. 
I'm hoping to change all the not good feelings. <laughs> the not good feelings. Um, Miss Sandra, I am coming back to you. We okay. talked just, uh, um, folks, you know, Sandra is a super open person. I mean, so she's talked to me a lot about the history. So, so, it's, so I know it because uh, my, my elder is not saying she's old, but someone that's, you know, been around before me um, passed it down. And so I just want to uh, say thank you Sandra, give you your flowers as they say you. now I appreciate it um so my uh, question for you is what types of investment economic and philanthropic we talk a lot about some of the things that you all did in Minnesota that were amazing um uh to to get money so so what are some types of investment that are needed to help facilitate the continued development and realization of, of this area well first of all Milwaukee is a little different when it comes to this philanthropic uh, community is a little bit different. It's, it's it's a little racist, okay? But we've had theaters that were vibrant theaters that just folded from the lack of support. I think that we're going to have to look beyond just Milwaukee for funds, ideals, and everything else to pull stuff together. And the other thing is, is that, that the economic culture here is, like they were saying earlier, it's fairly weak. However, there are other, other types of venues to go to and through for fun. Chicago sits next door, but you gotta build relationships with these people. You have to say that it's valid. I've seen the philanthropic community here actually you know, pit theaters against each other for the little bit of pool of money that they have decided that they're gonna put into communities of color, specifically our community. So, you know, our dialogue has to change. These are partnerships because they go out and they show all of these great things that they're doing in the black community, but you see things are drying up and they've been drying up. And when I look at all of these talented kids in this community, we can do better, but it has to start with the people that are getting all those tax breaks to make deeper and better investments into these communities. And they have to be relationships with the people that they're claiming to serve and the people they're also getting all of these breaks off of. So that conversation should not be subservient, but more we come into the table, less deal. Love it. Yes, thank you. Yeah, it can't um, be subservient. That's right. That's you right. Know, enough, agree. you know, or all these products that we buy, all the things that we do, it's not that you got to get out and boycott, but you got to let folks no, hey, this road is running both ways and, and being honest about it. You know, I'm not going to take money that limits me from talking about my black self or the people that I live around, you know, or the things that need to be done in my community. I'm going to tell you the truth. You may not like my conversation, but it's real. These are partnerships. Mm -hmm. You know, you give me a grant, but hey, you out there pushing and telling folks what you're doing up in here. But you cannot also limit me in terms of what I do and express myself as an artist because I'm going to tell the story. That's right. Reggie did not nod and John is not <laughs> smiling. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. Yeah, we have to uh, watch John. what you call philanthrop philanthropic racism. We have to deal with it. Yes, mm -hmm. ma'am. John, my next question uh, is for you. Uh, what is an initiative like the Bill Line Trail Neighborhood Development Project uh, need to do? to help reverse the trends in economic development, uh, jobs and neighborhood vitality that um, arose from the industry losses at the end of the last century? Yeah. <clears throat> I want to acknowledge that <clears throat> State Senator Lena Taylor is popping up on my screen all over the place with, <laughs> as if she's saying, let's keep the provocative conversation going. And that's, that's how I'm... So in the spirit of... State Senator Lena Taylor. <laughs> um, look, I heard your question. Um, what are the initiatives that make a difference now for a place like the Beer Line Trail? You've got great artistic infrastructure. You've got great place-making potential. And if you're, anything's gonna draw in investment now, it's the kind of self-empowerment that's gonna come from the, the kind of project you guys are talking about. That's the beginning, that's the engine. Um, so it actually is a good starting point. Like Reggie said, what can you recreate? The jazz clubs in, in, in a very segregated city were the integrated, integrating entities back in the day. 
it wasn't integration wasn't happening in the suburbs. I do not believe um, the these neighborhoods have the potential for integration. These neighborhoods have the potential for exceptional artistic, musical, and creative design. But <clears throat> there's a serious side to the question that I want to use this uh, my my last couple minutes here for. Um, one of the words that has come up repeatedly since the death of George Floyd and before the death of George Floyd, going back to the unarmed African-Americans who were being shot, killed, and wounded, um, one word has come into the discussion and it's misunderstood and misrepresented, but it gets down to what happens psychologically. What are the invisible wounds that Jacob Blake's three kids in the back seat saw? They will never be gunshot fatalities. They'll never be any statistic whatsoever. But there is a psychological injury it's too commonplace. And if you read the literature on what is called neurological trauma or PTSD, they all talk about, every one of them talks about an economic impact. They talk about chronic unemployment. Reggie, if you pipe in at any time, I'll be happy. They talk about generational cycles of poverty I mean, I won't be happy, but I, I do want to stoke this conversation. They talk about issues that are impossible to deal with unless you are a trained psychologist, a loving grandmother, an athletic coach after school who's going to give that time, that kid that holds space for that kid to talk. These are resources. Someone's, you got to talk to some, you got to tell your story to somebody in order to have resilience and healing and recovery. And until an individual, and this happens, by the way, I mean, the, the time is so short, I am going to run the risk of, you know, saying the wrong thing and misstepping. What I'm talking about will be found in any white industrial community that has deindustrialized. Janesville, Wisconsin, Northern Wisconsin with its paper mills. This is a universal attribute of human nature. When you expose a young child to extreme adversity, that young child doesn't go to MIT and that young child doesn't finish their job training, no matter how nice those soft skills job training are. Here, we'll show you Microsoft. We'll show you how to make a spreadsheet. Okay, so the I, I have become convinced that the fundamental issues after a scorched earth deindustrialization aren't more jobs, but there's something of a, there's so much understanding that needs to be built in that dialogue that isn't there yet. Yeah, John, thank you. Um, I'm going to take this heavy, uh, heavy this right to Daryl. Um, the question for you is um, the beer line has become the beer line rail, you know, became the beer line shred and the work is ongoing. How do you envision this community asset in helping bring new economic prospects to the neighborhood and business district? Yeah, part of it is the trail doesn't just end at capital. I mean, we have a lot of partners that are really pushing how this trail go farther northward, northward into Glendale, back into Milwaukee, how it connects to Oak Leaf Trail, how it connects to the corridor, um, because I think it's important to really spread this economic development to other communities within the city of Milwaukee. Um, I think we're blessed as an organization to have the opportunity to work with great partners. 
to really to bring this about. Uh, but I think the other key thing is that the residents are really starting to pay attention to the opportunity of what the trail can bring. Um, I mean, it cuts through neighborhoods, it cuts through uh, a business in Puma District. Um, and there's businesses, as we know, that's been here long term, but there's opportunity for us to repurpose a lot of these older buildings that would never be set up for industrial use again. So how do we take these, some of these properties and make them into creative spaces for residents to use, for small businesses to start up? Um, how do we create those opportunities to bring um, housing, affordable housing back into this community? How do we deal with the blighted properties um, that need to be repaired? How do we move property values up to an area where people can start building wealth, where we don't displace residents who have been in this neighborhood for a long term? Um, so we have a number of issues as we juggle the development of the trail is how is it impacting the businesses? How is it impacting the residents? How is it bringing economic opportunity back to this community? How is it dealing with the safety um, of residents within our community? And are we making sure that we're providing those long-term residents with the resources for them to stay here? And if they cannot stay, how are they passing that, that property, that wealth onto the next generation? So I think that's one of the things we need to think about with our community overall, how we are building wealth, how are we creating the opportunity for generations of African-Americans within the city of Milwaukee to be prosperous. Um, mm -hmm. As a small organization, we can only do so much. We provide that financial literacy. We, we provide those stepping stones to get people to the next area where they can start thinking about saving um, and not just going out and buying those products, new car, things like that, mm -hmm. that really doesn't add value over a long term because you buy a $10,000 car today and you take it off the lot, your value of the car is now lost $3,000. How do we start building wealth within our communities? And through this process, we want to be able to educate and involve residents and get them to a point where they can empower themselves to make change, changes within their community. Yeah, thank you. And now we are going to um, our last uh, question before we open up to a question from our audience is to our keynote, Reggie Jackson. So Reggie, and this is uh, kind of started off here with John. Um, so your question is uh, about in that same arena. Mm -hmm. um, today, to date, <laughs> What signs of promise and hope do you see as you research the communities um, in Milwaukee, specifically around the Bear Line Trail? Well, you know, I, I think it's, it's hard to find things that are being done in terms of investment wise that are helping the people that are in those communities now. You know, one of the words that I really just, I, this is a word in the English language that I absolutely wish would disappear, gentrification. It's such a beautiful word for something that is so ugly, right? Because what you're literally doing is you're looking at people being, being displaced. You know, what Dara was talking about wealth, right? We, we talk a lot about wealth building, but we don't talk enough about keeping the wealth that we have, right? The home ownership that we have in the Harambe neighborhood, older residents who pay for their homes years ago, right? They're now in a comfortable retired position, fixed income, and their property taxes keep going higher and higher and higher. And now they're in the process of losing some of their properties. The Great Recession that hit in 2008, 50% of all Black wealth in the United States disappeared. 50% of our wealth disappeared. We have to learn how to keep the wealth. And part of the way that we keep our wealth is that we have to find a way to convince our elected officials and the power brokers and, and policymakers in Milwaukee to understand, listen, you are doing something detrimental to this community by driving out long-term residents. Because what it does is it convinces their children and their grandchildren that you're not really wanted in those neighborhoods anymore, right? So what ends up happening is you, you, you take poor people and you move poor people to different parts of the city. And now you're taking people who aren't necessarily poor, people who are actually doing okay, they're retired, they have the homes paid off, they have that wealth in their families, and now you're taking that wealth from them. How do you find a, a creative solution to that? Because to me, 
listen, I understand how state law works and there's certain things that can't be done under state law, but there is no reason that with all the, the wealth we have in Milwaukee, all the people have boatloads of money in Milwaukee and they know who they are. There's no reason that they should allow these people to lose their homes. These people who are on a fixed income, these older black elders in our community that are losing their homes. And because we're losing that, we're continuing to lose more wealth. And what happens when you lose that wealth, when you lose that thing that children see, homeowners in a community, right? They don't grow up expecting to be a homeowner themselves. They grow up thinking that, well, I'm not going to have a home because I don't see anybody around me with a home. I think it's important for us to begin to focus on not what we're doing for people today, but what we're doing for the future, because we can't fix today's problems today. They're going to be fixed tomorrow and the day after the week after month. We have to think about looking further ahead and say, what, what do these projects mean for the people that are in those communities now? But what is it going to mean for the people that are in those communities five years from now? Because this is what's happening in the Harambe neighborhood. Every, everybody lives over. Listen, I've had residents after residents over in that neighborhood call me and say, Reggie, I'm afraid I'm going to lose my home. Mm -hmm. My property taxes went up $1,000 last year. This anti-displacement fund only gave me $450. That's only covering half of the increase last year. And I don't know if I'll get any this year. So we have to begin to understand that it's great that we have these developments happening. But we have to understand, listen, if you're not making that neighborhood better for the people that are there right now, you're making it better for somebody that's going to move in that neighborhood when those people are displaced. I don't want to see the people in Harambe displaced. Those that's are the right. people that I grew up seeing. Those are the elders in our community that we should have a great deal of respect for. You know, when, 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 when Sandra was sharing all these things, I was thinking like, man, this wealth of like historical knowledge about what Milwaukee was like when those people are displaced and moved out, th th that, that historical knowledge goes away with them too, right? We have to find a way to be creative enough about telling our elected officials and other public, public policy makers, listen, I love the fact that you're investing in these types of projects, but you have spent decades disinvesting in the black community, decades disinvesting. When I'm out in the community, it's what people tell me all the time. They say, Reggie, look at all of the billions being spent downtown. When are people going to start spending money in our neighborhoods? And I drive around Milwaukee a lot. I'm all over the city. There's no place in Milwaukee I'm afraid of as compared to some people. No place. Absolutely no place I'm afraid of. The only thing I'm afraid of is going to the suburbs. I'm more afraid of the suburbs <laughs> than the city. And just being honest with you. But what I'm afraid of is that these children in our community that are traumatized, like John said, they're not just traumatized by seeing violence and seeing other things. Listen, when I went back to my old block, and I saw some kids walking down the street, they look sad to me because they're looking up and they're seeing this house is boarded up and then that's vacant lot there. These kids can't, how can we possibly get the best out of them when they can't even see the best of the world around them, right? They have to go somewhere else to see things that look pretty. We have to invest in our children because listen, I'm 55 years old. Uh, who knows how long I'll live, but I want to, to, to live at a time where, where, where the, the young people that I taught when I was a teacher, I want to see a time when those young people can look at Milwaukee and, and say that they're proud of Milwaukee. They can see things in Milwaukee that they, that they gravitate towards. They want to be a part of those things. And I think it's important for all of us as residents of Milwaukee, something that happens in one part of town affects all of us. We don't necessarily know it. The mm -hmm. poverty we have in the city today, all of us are paying for it. Every time you drive over a pothole, it's because of poverty, right? Every time you see the devastation in the Black community, white people are impacted by it too, right? Everybody's impacted. It's like having a bad heart. Other organs will start to fail because of that bad heart. And until we figure out a way to fix in a real way the, the problem of racism leading to disinvestment in Black Milwaukee, and now in Hispanic Milwaukee as well, Milwaukee will never be fixed. You can have all of the pretty projects you want, but unless we start to, 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 to end the racist practices that have led to disinvestment and continue to have disinvestment in certain places, we, we're never gonna fix Milwaukee. We're just putting Band-Aids on a city that needs a tourniquet. And, and I'm very hopeful that this project can be replicated in some way in terms of using the voice of the community to drive change and investment in those communities. You don't necessarily have to invest in things that are gonna to lead to people making a bunch of money. 
you can lead investment that's going to lead to people having better lives and not necessarily making a boatload of money out of it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to just really quickly thank all of our panelists. Um, this was, we, we talked, Melissa and I talked about, uh, this might be a little heavy. I was just like, oh, you think so? <laughs> this was fantastic. I do want to just open it up to our audience members. Thank you, Senator uh, Taylor, for all of your comments. If there are any questions um, that folks have, please use the Q&A to ask them now. Um, our first question is from Robert Smith. He wants to know how large an investment will be required to make the Beer Line Trail a reality? Where will that money come from? And I'm going to defer this one to um, Daryl. Yeah, this project overall, what we're looking at is initially about $7 million uh, we're hoping to raise to kind of just build out the, the park area. And we know that investment hopefully will trickle off to other investments within, within the community, looking at housing, looking at businesses, uh, because we want this as a place where we can draw in those entrepreneurs to, to an area where they feel comfortable and they want to work within this community. Um, but we're going to do it in phases. The first phase is a connector building right there on uh, Richards and Keith. Then we're looking at the uh, Vienna Access Way so we can allow the community from Harumbe easy access onto the trail. Um, then we'll also be looking at Capitol Drive. So we'll be doing it in phases to ensure that um, we can get the, the park taken care of. But we also will be looking how we connect it to the broader trail within the city of Milwaukee or Milwaukee County. Thank you. Um, are there any uh, questions that folks want to add to the Q&A? Really quickly, if not, I'm going to, um, uh, we have about six minutes. I'm going to ask that each panelist, um, if they have any last comments, take about a minute to give. Um, and I, I'm sorry about that. I know John already mentioned the time. It's too short. It's too short. So I'm sorry about the time. Um, but I do want to make sure I respect folks the time that are here and get us out um, get us out at one o'clock. So I'm not getting any questions in the Q&A. Um, so I'm going to go back, uh, Sandra, uh, with you to start with me last uh, comments, you know, advice, whatever it is that you want to uh, get out. I'm going to open up the floor to you all now. I think what makes, um, you know, the Milwaukee artistic, at least the Black community, what makes it tough to raise funds is that people have to actually build um, collaboratives, economic collaboratives with each other, you know, because sometimes you get a grant in and you say, hey, you know, I'm not using this, but I can pass it on to so-and-so or you do things together, like our theaters should not be competing, but working together. So the support is doubled. So, you know, my whole thing is that we have to be strong enough within ourselves is that when money comes down the pike from any of those funders, and you know that you don't have a mission piece in there that fits it, but you know someone else that does, pass it on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just information that, um, you know, creative ways to raise funds to make, you know, to contribute to that capital campaign. Folks have to get beyond everything. We can donate performances. There's many things that we could do. We can write, I can sell some of the stuff that I write, but, you know, just to help. But I'm just saying that we have to look beyond our immediate selves and be able to effectively collaborate. And when something doesn't fit you, hand it over to someone else and bring it into the pot. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, okay. John. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> My turn. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, it's been a it's been such an honor. I'm gonna just riff on a couple of things that um, the Grio has just <coughs> talked about. I love that title, the Grio. <laughs> um, you use the word gentrification. I laugh out loud because people, <laughs> we're still hung up in economics from the 1970s. Honestly, we're still hung up in economics from this guy named Adam Smith, who in the year 17, whatever, wrote about this thing called the invisible hand. <laughs> mm -hmm. <Rough> <laughs> that investment will just flow automatically with, the, and, you know, you give a guy a job and 
um, check the box and walk away, issue the press release. It's actually really ridiculous. The, the kind of ridiculousness of, of, of the term gentrification implies that a, gen, a, a successful neighborhood has a Starbucks, you know, has a couple of gleaming boutiques. You know, what is gentrification? It's got, you know, uh, houses that are being, you know, furnished by Saks Fifth Avenue. I say, just for the sake of this conversation, go back to Harambe or go back to Sharon Adams' neighborhood. There's not a Starbucks there, although her daughter put in her own little latte shop where people can congregate and create a sense of community. It's, there are peach trees, there are organic gardens. That's a successfully turned around neighborhood. Investment will follow. I would hope that, riffing again on Reggie, my, my hope is that the nation can begin to watch Milwaukee because Milwaukee deserves the nation's attention. This is a city with its back against the ropes. If it can do it, any city can. What This city should become the urban laboratory. Matt Desmond, when he needed to write a book about evictions, where did he go to write a book about evictions? This city deserves attention and I hope that it can make the progress and be the beacon for the rest of the country. And just as for the issue of trauma, because it, it, I don't see how you can't not deal with that. I personally, as a white, fully entitled guy, cannot bring myself to watch the videos that I see that are passed around. I, therefore, I cannot imagine the vicarious trauma of someone needing to watch those videos and say, that could be my dad, that could be my brother, that could be my uncle, that could be my neighbor. Can't get my head around what that's like. Thank you, John. Thank you, um, <laughs> Daryl, and then uh, and then Reggie. Uh, I'll go ahead and have Reggie speak first. Thank, thank you, dear. I, I'm going to use the, the word that people are afraid of: reparations. Milwaukee mm -hmm. is ripe for reparations. This is we we are like the poster child of a city that reparations could fix, right? Mm -hmm. We we we're not talking about reparations for slavery. Listen, slavery did, first of all, slavery did end in 1865. Black people were still enslaved in 1940 in, in, in America legally enslaved because the 13th Amendment allows people who are convicted of crimes to still be enslaved. A hundred years of Jim Crow segregation followed the end of slavery, right? The official end of slavery. If you cannot account for that hundred years of, of just degradation in every way, shape, or form. All of these federal programs that assisted white people in moving to the middle and upper middle classes, you know, social security that we weren't eligible for, unemployment insurance we weren't eligible for, the FHA loans, which made white people homeowners when they weren't homeowners before, the GI Bill, which black men couldn't use coming back from World War II to go to college because Ole Miss wouldn't accept them, University of Alabama wouldn't accept them. If we can, can harness the understanding of what's happened the last hundred years to black people and say that Milwaukee is the poster child for that and say, man, if we could create reparations, re re listen, the reparations is about repair. That's the I core see. of reparations. Right. It's not about giving people a check, but mm. get, listen, don't think that we don't deserve a check. There has never been reparations given where people didn't get a check. All of a sudden people are, oh, black people shouldn't get a check for reparations. Listen, we better get a check too. <laughs> Reparations better come in the form of some type of a check. Everybody else gets a check. We deserve a check too. Now, hey, if people want to go and spend the money on whatever they want to spend on, that's up to them. But listen, repair means to repair the damage done. Repair. Listen, Milwaukee owes Black people something. You've disinvested in the Black community basically since 1970. Actually, longer than that, you've disinvested. You tore down houses and built a freeway in, in the late 60s that you never built you. and then thank left you, those blocks you. vacant for three decades. You owe us for that. Milwaukee, listen, somebody owes us. And if Milwaukee isn't a poster child for where reparations should start, it's not Birmingham or Montgomery, Alabama, Jackson, Mississippi, Milwaukee. Because listen, I, I tell people, my nickname for Wisconsin, you, you probably heard me say this, is Mississippi. Mississippi. I moved here from, from Mississippi to, to, to Wisconsin. I had white classmates in Mississippi. Came to Milwaukee, didn't have white classmates mm. in third or eighth grade. So don't tell me about racism in Mississippi. 
Racism right. in Wisconsin is alive and well and strong. And just because they're not wearing Ku Klux Klan uniforms no more doesn't mean they're not members of the Ku Klux Klan, right? So I think what we should do is we need to demand reparations for Milwaukee because the disinvestment that's happened, you know, beer line, the trail ended, all those businesses surrounding it disappeared that John documented. Somebody owes us for that. Listen, Black people, we came to Milwaukee for those jobs and then the jobs disappeared. We didn't all of a sudden get lazy. Somebody took the jobs away. Somebody owes us for that. Reparations is due, brother. Reparations is due immediately. Thank and you. give me my oh, check. Reggie. Thank you, Reggie. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so, dear, I know you wanted the last uh, before I thank everyone and get us out of here. Uh, your last word. Yeah, it was just an honor for me to be part of the panel. It wasn't expected, but I truly enjoyed being with John, Reggie, Cassandra. Um, as always, when we do these events, you know, I learn a lot more, but it, it also makes me more humble and really understand the work that I have ahead of me. I have a lot more. And by knowing that, I know I need to partner and leverage more resources coming into this community to make sure that our residents are not left out of what's happening within the city of Milwaukee. So on that note, I just want to thank everybody for the opportunity. Thank you, I want to thank um, uh, Reggie for uh, being our keynote, um, Sandra, John, Daryl, you for stepping in. This was fantastic. I think the last one I was like, oh, this was great. I think this one was probably my, my, my favorite. I mean, it's a continued conversation that we should um, and need to have over and over again just to play even some of these sound bites because I'm like repair exactly exactly thank you for putting it like that because that's real um thank you to the audience for being with us for listening for following us throughout these series it's so appreciated um thank you for the folks that are behind the scenes that we do not see that are making this happen especially the GMC um, Melissa for all your work um on this Please join us for our next event on May 25th, where we'll discuss a report that was done by the Urban Institute about creative placemaking in Milwaukee. And with that, I want to say, I will say thank you so very much, and I will see you next time. Thank you, Rosalind. Thank you. Thanks, Rosalind.